to Christ Community Church. Whether you're joining us online or on site, we're glad you've made CCC a part of your week. Our Sunday experience begins soon, but we'd like to invite you to introduce yourself by filling out our Connect form, by scanning the QR code on the seat back in front of you, or by visiting cccomaha.info. And if you're joining us online, we'd appreciate it if you would share this service from whichever platform you're watching on. Our prayer is that God meets you right where you are and that you experience the fullness of his love for you today. stand to our feet together. We're going to begin our time by singing. We put our hands together. This song is a proclamation of what we believe in Jesus. We sing it out together. I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life. One redemption, one confession, I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion, by His blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection, hallelujah, His life is destiny. to God a Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome, the King who was and is evermore will be, in Jesus' mighty and proclaim this together. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Sing that again. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ.
church. My name is Eric, and it's so good to be here with you today as we worship together. You know, worship, it can take many forms for all of us, uh, whether, whether it's something you do in secret for God, maybe you're tempted by something sinful and you, you choose to deny yourself that, or maybe you choose to give an encouraging word to someone who's wronged you. Whatever that looks like, worship is very powerful. And in, in this morning's context, worship is all of us gathered in this room, whether you're here or watching online, we're all one body raising our voice to worship our God and King. So let's lift our voices this morning.
Could you just have a seat for just a moment? The great truth of Jesus being the king. You know, if you're familiar with the church calendar, uh, my name is Ryan, by the way, one of the worship leaders here. And if you're familiar with the church calendar, you know that this Sunday is one week before Easter, which we often call Palm Sunday. And we can st see the story, it begins Holy Week, can begin, we can see the story in John 12 of Jesus riding in to the city of Jerusalem and being received and acknowledged and adored as the King, as the Messiah. It's called Palm Sunday because they would put, they put palm leaves down, but not just palm leaves, the, those were valuable, but they took their coats off and any clothing they could spare and set that on the ground as well in an act of worship and honor to the king to separate where he rode through on his donkey with the ground. As I reflected on this scripture through the week, I was reminded of how much time I've spent not acknowledging him as king in my life. The time that I've wanted to be my own king of my future, of my money, of my relationships, and just a great reminder and acknowledgement for me, and I think many of you can relate, of continuously acknowledging Jesus as the king, continuously honoring him as they laid down their cloaks in adoration, continuous reception in our hearts as king. And that comes with surrender according to Romans 12, that we would make room for surrender for his will in our lives, that we would make room for his will. And that's my prayer for myself and for you as well. We're gonna sing one last song and we want to invite you to reflect on that truth during this song. We'll just have you remain seated for the first part. And we invite you to sing along if you'd like, um, but to pray as well or to tell God that he is king and acknowledge him as king, um, to be honest with him about your doubts. Ultimately, our worship would be that we would make room for God's will and his truth in our lives.
that we were never meant to carry in the first place. So right now, Lord, as those situations, family members and friends come to mind, we surrender each of them to you. We know that you love those people more than we ever could. And you're in the business of handling all situations because you are God. Thank you for this opportunity to pause and acknowledge you as the King and as the Lord over our lives. And I pray that that would not just last this morning, but that it would last throughout our whole week and our whole lives. In your name that we pray. Amen. Welcome to Christ Community Church. If you are looking to get plugged in, the best place to get started is cccomaha.info. If you're new, we would like to invite you to fill out our connect form so we can get to know you better. If you're looking for additional ways to connect, cccomaha.info is the simplest way to sign up to serve, find a class, or learn more about anything that you hear today. Are you new to Christ Community Church and looking to take your best next step? We would love to invite you to our four-week experience called CCC 101 where you'll encounter Jesus, connect to community, discover your purpose, and contribute to kingdom impact. 101 is a great place to ask challenging questions about faith in the church, meet and relate to others on their spiritual journey, and find steps to connect with CCC where you are most passionate. You can attend in any order, so you can begin as soon as next week. We are excited for where God is leading you and how we can be a part of your spiritual journey. We are deeply convinced that prayer is the primary work of God's people. Maybe you're weighed down right now by a heavy burden, or maybe you're excited and celebrating something that God has done in your life, or possibly somewhere in the middle. It would be our great joy to come alongside you no matter where you're at in prayer. You can do that on a Sunday morning in our prayer room, or you can submit prayer requests absolutely anytime at CCC Omaha. God is building his kingdom here, there, and everywhere. Because of your faithful giving, we are seeing children given the opportunity to participate in soccer and flag football, and so much more as lives are transformed by the gospel. If you are new to giving, would you prayerfully consider how God may be asking you to partner with him? You can sign up to give online or drop a gift in the black boxes at the back of the worship center. No matter how you choose to give, your giving matters as we reach one more. We love getting to celebrate those who have made the decision to follow Christ. At Christ Community Church, we do this through the act of baptism, which publicly declares, I am following Jesus. If you haven't been baptized yet, you're invited to sign up for an upcoming baptism opportunity. You can learn more and sign up at cccomaha.info. Before recognizing God in my life, I felt like I was an imposter and I was constantly living in fear. I was lost and alone. I was angry and bitter. I was hurt and I was carrying that pain. I was worthless and I was broken and I believe my life was pointless. But since that time, slowly I started realizing I am a daughter of God, and I am unconditionally loved. I have been forgiven. I am strong. I am creative and beautiful. I am perfectly imperfect with my brokenness and I am finding purpose in the life God has for me.
Well, good morning, church. My name's Mark. I serve here as uh, one of the ministers, and Easter really is an amazing event to celebrate. We have an amazing thing to celebrate on Easter, amen? The resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Come on, let's give it up for the resurrection of Jesus. If there's anything to cheer for, that's something to cheer for. Uh, and Easter's also a great time to be inviting people to have a first experience at church. There's a lot of people who will come on Easter that might not come on a different day, and I know a lot of you have been praying for one more for like six months now, and maybe today would be a good time to take a risk and invite them to come uh, next week and participate in our services. They are going to be amazing, and uh, you'll have an amazing celebration. You won't regret bringing friends along with that. Well, uh, I want to start off the message today with a question, survey question. How many of you guys have ever seen the 1991 movie City Slickers? Anyone seen City Slickers? Yeah, a bunch of you guys have. If you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a great movie, or at least it's a, a movie with great moments in it. I don't know if it's a great movie, but it's got some great moments in it. And the story is that Billy Crystal, 38-year-old uh, kind of rising executive who's a city slicker, wants to be able to get back in touch with the simpler things of life, so he decides to try out being a cowboy for a while. He goes up into the hills and his, you know, the Curly, the senior cowboy who's kind of training him he's by, uh, you know, the actor's Jack Palance, he's this old, crusty cowboy, and he's teaching him about the meaning of life. And at one point he says to him, son, you want to know what the secret to life is? And Billy Crystal says, sure. And he says, right here. And Billy says, your finger? He says, no, no, one thing. Just one thing. You stick to that and everything falls into place. He starts writing off and Billy says, wait, 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 wait. Well, what's the one thing? And Curly says, that's for you to figure out. <laughs> now, I found that moment in movie history to be both brilliant and frustrating all at the same time. As this moment, you go, what's the one thing? You're hanging on the edge. You want to know what the one thing is. What's that one thing that's better than everything? What's that one thing that you can wrap your life around? What's the one thing that's better than Creighton winning in double overtime and going to the Sweet 16? Well, there is something better, young man. And the cool thing is that Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 if you want to discover what the one thing is uh, according to the Apostle Paul. It's the one thing that brings meaning to life, the one thing that can align your soul with the universe, the one thing that defines our existence, and it's found in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So here's what it says. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word that I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Okay, you're starting to smell what Paul's talking about here with his one thing that's most important. He says, I want to remind you of something. This is the most important thing. This is the gospel. And on it, you have believed and you have taken your stand. Hang on to the one thing. Otherwise, what? You've believed in vain. Your faith is worthless. Everything that you've banked your life on is nothing if the gospel itself is not central to your lives. This is his big reminder and his big deal statement. Now, all of 1 Corinthians is pointing to this moment. I don't know if you know this, but the way 1 Corinthians is built is it's built towards a climax of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Chapter 15 is the climax chapter, and in light of chapter 15, everything else makes sense. All of these things have been the warm-up act, talking about wisdom and righteousness and sexual morality and marriage and singleness and lawsuits are all the ramp-up to 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection. 
In fact, Dr. Carl Pagenkamper, who's on our staff, says it's wise to read 1 Corinthians backwards, reading 1 Corinthians 15 first, because by that light, all of these things make sense in light of the resurrection, in light of what's coming in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we're hitting the climax of the book and the climax of life. Verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Can you feel Paul holding the finger out right now? I pass this on to you of first importance. This is number one, guys. This is right here. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now hang on here for just a moment. Because you could summarize the gospel message according to these two verses. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. If you say, you know what, I'd love to find a passage in the Bible that's worth meditating on, that's super important, that I should highlight in my Bible, that I should memorize and carry with me everywhere I go. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4 are two great verses to mark. And let me unpack these a little bit, because Paul says, this is, this is what's most important, guys. He's telling the Corinthians, don't miss this. All of the other stuff, important, but not super important. This is of first importance right here. Number one, that Christ, okay? Christ uh, is the central figure in what he's talking about. Now, most of you know that Christ is not just Jesus' last name. Christ is a title, Christ is the same word as Messiah would be in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew. Well, Christ is a similar word in Greek. It means the anointed one. It means the king who is coming. It means the one who we've been expecting. The one who has been predicted from all times past. He is here. So Christ, number two, died for our sins. Central to the message of Christianity is that the anticipated King Messiah came and he died on our behalf. It's a substitutionary swap rama God says, I will take your mess, your failures, and your sins, and I will trade them for my grace. Has there ever been a better deal in the history of humanity than trading my mess for God's goodness? God says, I'll take all of the things that you've screwed up in your life and instead I'll give you adoption and eternal life and a relationship with me and a brand new family. This is central to the message that God gives us. And all you have to do is have the courage to admit that you've got sins that need to be traded in and that you believe that Jesus is the one who has already paid for those sins. So Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What Paul's pointing out is this has been the plan the whole time. Like God knew that this has been coming and in light of Jesus' uh, uh, death on the cross, all kinds of things that have been happening in the Old Testament for thousands of years make sense. For example, the uh, Passover where the angel of death passed over every Israelite household that had the blood of the lamb on it was a forecasting of the fact that one day, everybody who has the blood of Jesus on their lives, well, the angel of death will pass over them and they'll be able to have eternal life. Or you take a look at the Levitical sacrifices where animals were sacrificed for the sins of the people. Well, that's just a forecast of what Jesus was going to do. Or you take a look at a passage like Isaiah 53 that in graphic detail predicts the crucifixion of Jesus. That's all pointing forward to him. What Paul's saying is that this was God's master plan all the way from the beginning and it has its climax in Jesus and Jesus alone. Then Paul points out, he was buried. Now, I think he points this out as of first importance because you're not talking about Jesus' death as a metaphoric death or a symbolic death. It's not just that he got really tired or he lacked in popularity. Paul's saying, no, literally, he was killed in a horrific way. 
In fact, when he was killed, he was speared in the side by the people who were killing him on the cross just to be sure that he was dead. Blood and water came out separately. And when they took him down off of the cross, there was a Roman centurion who signed his death certificate, a guy who was an expert in death. And if that wasn't enough, then they wrapped up his body in 100 pounds of linens and spices and laid him in a stone-cold tomb. Paul's pointing out he was not just symbolically dead, he was stone cold dead and buried in a tomb. Then, he says, he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. Now, this is the you're kidding moment. Like, he was actually literally raised from the dead, like physically bodily raised, like walking around and talking raised, like you can touch him and ask questions of him raised from the dead. Yes, for real, raised from the dead. And can I just pause for a moment here to say, this is something that makes Christianity utterly unique among world religions. I'm oftentimes frustrated and sometimes uh, mystified by the people say, who say, you know, all religions are pretty much the same thing. You know, they, they basically teach that God is good and that we should love each other, right? And I love to respond, well, yeah, world religions really are basically the same thing, except they define the problem with the world differently, and they talk about the solution to the world differently, and they're different about morality and the nature of God and the nature of humanity and what happens after you die in salvation. Besides that, they're pretty much exactly the same. One of the things, though, not the only thing, but probably the biggest thing that puts Christianity in a category all by itself is that our founder, Jesus of Nazareth, died and did not stay dead. Don't overlook this simple fact because Confucius is still in the grave. Muhammad is still six feet under. The Buddha is still pushing up daisies. But Jesus rose from the dead. And if you're going to trust somebody to tell you about eternal life and life after death, you want to trust the guy who rose from the dead. Amen? <coughs> Jesus died, was buried, and was raised from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, Paul's pointing out once again that not only was Jesus' death according to the scriptures, but his resurrection was according to the scriptures. And this is an interesting moment as well, because many of you know that before Paul was a missionary, a Christian missionary, he was a Pharisee. And there were debates among the different Jewish sects about what happened after you died. Different sects, like there was the Essenes, and uh, there was the Sadducees, and there was the Pharisees. And one of the biggest debates between the Pharisees and the Sadducees is what happens after you die. The Pharisees said, after you die, the scripture points to a resurrection. The Sadducees said, after you die, there is no resurrection. And that's why they were sad, you see. So Paul's basically saying, you know, the resurrection has been in the scriptures the entire time. Christ died, was buried, and raised according to the scriptures. Pharisees would point to passages like this, this one in Daniel. And many of those, I'm sorry, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth. That was the right verse, sorry. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. He's saying if you go back in the book of Daniel, it shows obviously people are going to rise from the dead. Because when Paul's talking about scriptures, he's talking about Old Testament scriptures. The New Testament scriptures had not been written, most of them, by this point. So he's saying in the Old Testament, it predicted this. And it's not just Daniel 12 too. If you're interested in looking up a few more, here's a few more from uh, the Psalms and Isaiah. There's a bunch of verses in the Old Testament that allude to the idea that resurrection is real and there's going to be a final judgment and we'll come face to face with God someday. But basically Paul's saying it was a part of God's master plan from the beginning. He told us this thousands of years in advance, and now the climax of world history has happened. Jesus has come, and he has fulfilled all of these predictions that God had for us. In Jesus, the view of the Pharisees of resurrection was vindicated because Jesus was laid in a rock-hewn tomb, and three days later, 
he was risen from the dead, the tomb itself was empty, okay? This is one of those factors that's a fact of history that must be wrestled with for every single person. I like to call it the empty factor. Someone say the empty factor. Uh, The idea of the empty factor is that Jesus was laid in the tomb on Friday night. Saturday was the Sabbath day, the day of preparation, so everybody just kind of let it go there. But on Sunday, on Sunday, the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. The stone, which is somewhere between one and 2,000 pounds. So think of a stone that's like between four and eight of me. That deal does not accidentally roll away. But instead, it had been rolled away supernaturally by God. The guards that had been placed in front of the tomb, there was a full set of Roman soldiers that had been placed in front of the tomb to protect it from any kind of grave robbers. And Pontius Pilate had taken a wax seal and put it on the edge of where the stone meets the rock put his seal in there, essentially saying, if anybody messes with this tomb, you're messing with the Roman government. But on Sunday morning, the guards had fled, the seal was broken, the stone was rolled away, and when the women showed up at the tomb, they found out that the tomb was? It was empty. It was empty. This is good news. Now, they go back and they tell the guys, and of course the guys don't believe the girls, right? Does anything change in this world? So they go running out to the tomb to check for themselves. It says Peter and John ran to the tomb. John's talking about this, and John throws in my favorite detail related to the resurrection. He said, me and Peter ran to the tomb, and I got there first. (laughs) Peter went inside to look in the tomb, and when he looked inside the tomb, guess what he found? He found that it was? It was empty. This is the empty factor. In fact, everybody who was an opponent to Jesus could go and check this out. Like the Romans, they wanted Jesus dead. The Jewish leaders, they wanted Jesus dead. So if they wanted to squash this resurrection myth when it started coming about, all they had to do was walk over to the tomb, produce the body, and that would stop the entirety of the movement. And I'm confident that they did go back to that tomb and they did look inside and they too found out that it was empty. And anybody who was hearing this proclaimed could walk back to the tomb. Anybody who's got two legs and an IQ bigger than their shoe size could look inside the tomb and find out that it was empty. In fact, I've been to Israel and I've had the opportunity to look into the place that they say Jesus' body was laid And even now, 2,000 years later, the tomb is still empty. Now, what what makes up for that? Well, it makes sense that Jesus rose from the dead. But it gets bigger than that. It's not just the empty factor. There's also the estrogen factor, okay? The estrogen factor that comes into play. And this is the idea that it was women who discovered that the tomb was empty. Now, some people have theorized that some folks made up the idea that Jesus rose from the dead. They made up the whole story, and they made up that women were the first ones at the tomb. But this does not make sense in ancient culture because women were not allowed to testify in a court of law. Their testimony was not considered to be valid, so why would you have the first person to discover the empty tomb be somebody whose testimony was not considered to be valid? I think there's a much better explanation as to why women were the ones who discovered the body. I think that it's because God was not only creating evidence for the resurrection, but he was trying to right a wrong in their culture and say, no, no, in the most important event in the history of the world, I want the first eyewitnesses to be women. It's just like God to upend society and do things in a way that would surprise everybody in order to create legitimacy for something that is on his heart. Well, it's not just that factor. I would also say the third factor is the chrysalis factor, the chrysalis factor. So they went to an empty tomb, but I was actually a little bit disingenuous in that the tomb wasn't totally empty. There was something that was inside. Because when Peter went into the empty tomb, he found this shell. This looked like a cocoon that had been poof, fallen down. 
It was the hundred pounds of linens and spices that they had buried Jesus in and wrapped his body in. In fact, the gospels give us a debate or a, a detail with this that's interesting in that there was one cocoon for his body and then just a little bit away from it was the cocoon from his head. And it wasn't like somebody like woke up and you know took all of their grave clothes off. It was as if the body had been zapped out and the shell just kind of went, whoo, and was left. There's no other explanation than that something supernatural happened in this moment. But it's not just the empty factor, the estrogen factor, and the chrysalis factor. You've also got the he showed up factor. The he showed up factor. The idea that Jesus was seen walking around and talking to people and making guest appearances everywhere he went. This is where Paul continues in verse 5. He says, uh, and that he appeared. So he raised on the third day and that he appeared to Cephas. That's another name for Peter. And then to the 12. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of brothers and sisters at the same time. Do you guys realize that? Jesus made a public appearance to 500 people at once, most of whom are still living. So Paul's saying, you can go back and meet these people and talk to them. They can tell you that Jesus did, in fact, show up to them, though some have fallen asleep or died. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. He appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. Now, there is not in the Bible one comprehensive list of all of the resurrection appearances of Jesus, but if you put together this list plus the other resurrection appearances that we hear about in the Gospels, you might get a list that looks something like this. Here's some post-resurrection appearances. Some of you might want to take a picture of this because you'll want to look it up later and go see, okay, what were all of the resurrection appearances? But he appeared, first of all, to Mary Magdalene in the garden, and then he appeared to certain women as they came and returned to the tomb in order to be able to bring the spices for uh, his burial. He appeared to Simon Peter himself uh, on the road to Emmaus. You might remember there was two followers on the road to Emmaus. To all of the disciples except Thomas, so there were 10 of them that were gathered in the upper room, and you might remember they went back to Thomas and they said, hey, Jesus appeared to us, and he's like, I'm the skeptic. Unless I put my fingers in his hand and my hand in his side, I am not going to believe you guys. So Jesus showed up again to another dinner party when Thomas was there. And he says, hey, my man, put your fingers in my hands and put your hand in my side. It's really me. I'm alive. (coughs) That you can touch me. I'm alive. Then he appeared to several disciples at the Sea of Galilee. Later on to uh, 11 disciples on a mountain in Galilee. To James, and then to the 11 disciples at Jerusalem immediately before the ascension. So this is where he's on the Mount of Olives, and he says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. And then finally to Paul, Saul of Tarsus, when he appeared to him on the road to Damascus. What's interesting is that Jesus appeared physically, bodily, over a period of 40 days. He preached to them about the kingdom of God, and then his appearances stopped. And the disciples were transformed from that moment, from people who were cowering in an upper room to people who were the biggest proponents of Jesus that the history has ever known. They went from being afraid of death to being utterly fearless, to proclaiming the gospel all around the world. These guys, uh, some people have accused the disciples of making up a story about Jesus' resurrection in order to be able to attain power and wealth in this world. Uh, I hear skeptics give this argument from time to time, and I'm like, man, you don't know the story of the apostles at all, do you? Because they did not accumulate any kind of power and wealth. They accumulated persecution and death. And despite that, they decided that they would never recant their faith. Not one of them ever recanted. People who make stuff up recant before they die. But people who believe what they're teaching, they'll go to their death. And every single one of these, except for John, who is exiled to Patmos, went to their death. Well, Paul continues on, and he says, after he talks about his appearance, he talks about how his life has changed. He says, for I'm the least of the apostles... And don't even deserve to be called an apostle because 
I persecuted the church of God. Before he was an apostle, he was a persecutor. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. You know, I worked harder than all of them. Not me, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. Paul's saying that the power of the resurrection is not only historical fact, it's utterly life-changing. And Paul is example number one of somebody who went from persecuting those who talked about Jesus to being someone who was one of those who talked about Jesus and was able to have his life changed to the point of, I'm willing to give everything in my life for this one major thing. Now, I wanna talk to you for a moment if you're somebody who has never wrestled this idea down. So let's just say you're somebody who grew up in the church. Maybe you even went to Catholic schools or Christian schools growing up and you were always in this environment and you were always told that you're supposed to just have faith. And people, you ask hard questions of leaders and maybe they say, oh, just, just believe, just have faith. I'm convinced that the gospel is not faith based on faith alone. It's not a blind faith, faith that has no evidence, but instead the Christian faith is faith based on historical facts. It's faith that's based on the resurrection of Jesus. There are very few events in all of world history that have five eyewitnesses that will attest to the fact that they were true that wrote down their eyewitness testimony. There are very few events that have as much circumstantial evidence around it as the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, I was one of those kids that grew up as a church rat and was told my whole life, just have faith. I mean, people rising from the dead, you know, talking snakes, walls of water being parted, just have faith that those things take place. But it was when I was 16 that I was confronted with the evidence around this that there's actually historically credible evidence that demonstrates that Jesus rose from the dead. And eventually, after doing my homework of the both pros and cons, I came to the conclusion that it would take more faith for me to reject the resurrection of Jesus than it would for me to embrace the resurrection of Jesus. It was then that intellectually I was convinced that the gospel actually was true. It was after looking at the evidence. You see, God doesn't want us to commit intellectual suicide. He wants us to align with the truth, and he is the truth, and so he shows us the truth of who he is. Or maybe you're somebody who's skeptical. Maybe you're joining us online. <clears throat> maybe you're here in the room, and you're somebody who's saying, you know what? I never knew that there was this kind of evidence that was out there. I thought that religious people were just trying to feel better about themselves or maybe have hope for eternal life. But the truth is, God showed up for real in history as a person, and he proved that he was God by dying and rising from the dead. And you have to wrestle with this evidence. You have to decide for yourself, is it actually true? In fact, I think that it could be said that the life, or that the death and resurrection of Jesus is the centerpiece of his entire life that his whole life and our entire faith hinges on the death and resurrection of Jesus. We have a little graphic on this one. Yeah, so Jesus there, it's central to him is his death and his resurrection. But even more than that, I think it could be argued that Jesus is the centerpiece of world history and that his death and resurrection is the centerpiece of his life. There is no other life that's been more effective, more influential, more dynamic, more read about, more talked about, more sung about than the life of Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, every time you write a paper or date a legal document or write a check, if you're still writing checks, every time you date it according to this one solitary life. All of history hinges on the life of Jesus. It cracked me up about 20 or 30 years ago when scholars started saying, well, we can't call it B.C. and A.D. because that points to Jesus. We have to call it B.C.E. and C.E. now. As if it doesn't still point to Jesus. No matter what you call it, Jesus is the centerpiece of history and the obvious evidence is the whole world has changed because of this life 
and Jesus' life rests on his death and his resurrection. So any intellectually honest person has got to wrestle with this evidence and ask themselves the question, is it true? And my hope is that when you look at this evidence, you will find the same thing that I found, that Jesus himself is credible and that he rose from the dead. Paul continues on, we're gonna skip down to verse 20, to talk about the meaning of this resurrection from the dead. Here's what he says about it. He says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. A couple things you need to know in order to be able to understand this part of the passage. Number one is, what's the idea of first fruits? That's not a common American concept, but it's pretty uh, easy to understand. First fruits is the idea that whenever you bring in a harvest, there's a first bushel. So let's say you own a big uh, apple orchard. There's always going to be a first bushel of apples that come in, even if there's a thousand that come afterwards. And there's something special about the first bushel, partly because you know you haven't had any for a year, so it's ultra tasty. But also it becomes a promise that the orchard is working right and all of the rest is going to come in. Well, Paul says that Jesus is the first fruits of a resurrection that's to take place for everybody. He's the first one that comes in, but it's a promise that anybody who trusts in him, even if it's billions and billions of people, can also experience a resurrection with Jesus. So the resurrection is not just a fact of history, it's a hope for you and for me, and this is good news, amen? amen. He's the first fruits and we're following. But Paul also does an interesting story of the world in three parts of a play, like three acts of a play. He says, you've got all the way at the beginning, you've got Adam. And just as in Adam all die, so in Jesus all will be made alive. All the way back in the world history, the first screw up in world history was Adam in the Garden of Eden. He, you know, he messed it up. But the truth is, I messed it up too, you messed it up too. Adam was just the first of the screw ups and all of us have screwed up ever since then. And because Adam messed up, he introduced into this world death, both physical and spiritual death for humanity. So if you are in Adam, in other words, if you're a human being, you're going to die. That's just our trajectory in life. Everyone's aware of that, right? You guys aware of that? You're gonna die, right? We're all gonna die because we're in Adam. But in Jesus, all can be made alive because he rose from the dead and he promises you too can rise from the dead. So Adam brought the curse, Jesus reversed the curse. Adam brought death and Jesus brought life. He's saying this is the two acts, but there's another act that's still coming because in the end, Jesus is going to take all things, all dominion, all authority and all powers and put them under his feet. You may be wondering, what are the dominion authority powers? What is he talking about there? Well, the Bible uses those words to talk about systems of evil that are present in our planet. That in this world that we live in, there are political systems of evil, and there are economic systems of evil, and there are media systems of evil. You guys are aware of all these things, if you're aware of what's going on in the news. There are systems of evil all over our world. But it's more than that. The Bible teaches that there are spiritual powers of darkness that are behind these systems of evil, and that when Jesus comes back in the end, he is going to subdue under his feet all of the evil, all of the systems, and all of the spiritual powers that are behind him. This is good news, amen? amen. It means that evil is going to be contained, and then everybody who has the resurrection power of Jesus gets to live in an existence that is not under that evil power or even affected by that evil power anymore. Hallelujah. So he leaves us with a choice. This is the story of the universe. 
Death was brought in by Adam. Life was brought in by Jesus. The universe is headed towards a trajectory where evil is going to be contained and everybody who has life gets a new life in Jesus. Death no longer reigns. No more mourning, no more crying, no more tears, no more death, just the presence of God. Yeah. Guys, I wanna tell you, this is amazingly good news. And there's a lot of people in this room who are cheering because you know this is really good news for those of us who have believed. But if you haven't believed, you know, maybe you're somebody who's like me, who's going through a skeptical phase. Maybe you're somebody who's from outside of the church and you're just hearing for the first time that there's actually evidence for faith and not just being expected to take a blind leap of faith off a cliff. I want you to know, no matter what your background is, Jesus is inviting you to move from outsider to insider. Jesus is saying, I've already conquered and defeated death, and you can know eternal life by trusting in me. God cares about you so much that he left the cosmos of heaven to come to the cosmos of earth to suffer and to die and then to beat death for you and for me. He crossed the universe for you. He loves you that much. And he wants you to know this good news of the resurrection that he comes to bring us. And he wants you to know that he's inviting you to be an insider. Everybody's invited. It's your choice. Do you want to trade your sins for God's grace? Do you want to trade death for resurrection? Then Jesus says, come be a part of my family. I've got this new kingdom that I'm setting up. A kingdom of love and joy and peace and purpose and meaning and well, I'd love for you to be a part of that as well. Come, come be in my family of good for this world. And if you like to do that, I want to give you the chance. In fact, I'm going to ask you to stand everywhere in the room. If you're at home, go ahead and stand at home as well. And I'm going to pray a prayer of accepting God's gift of grace, trusting in him for salvation. And if you want to pray that prayer with me, just go ahead and you can pray it out loud together and and say yes to Jesus today. You can have a divine transaction in a moment that lasts for the rest of your life and lasts for the rest of eternity, but there does come a place in your life where you have to say yes to Jesus. And today I'm gonna to pray a prayer. The words of the prayer aren't magical, but the attitude of your heart makes all the difference in the world. Will you say yes to Jesus for eternal life and all that he offers you? Let's pray together. God, I wanna pray for my friends who are here today, <laughs> uh, who have come here from all different places spiritually. I just pray, God, that their hope in the resurrection would be real and would be sure. I pray, God, as your spirit weaves together people's lives and the amazing ways that you do, and I, I can never figure it out, and I'm just amazed when I hear people's stories of what you're doing. God, I pray that you would touch some hearts today of people who need to make today their day of yes, their day of salvation. And if that's you, if you're somebody who says, I wanna make that my day, then go ahead and just pray this simple prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I can admit that I've sinned and I wanna trade in my sins for your grace. I believe in your death on the cross as the means to make that happen. And I believe in your resurrection from the dead to give me new life. So I accept that into my life right now. I trust you, Jesus, your goodness, your strength, your power. And I pray in his name, the name of Jesus, our savior, our sanctifier, our healer, and our coming king. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Can we welcome our friends who have said yes to Jesus for the first time here today? And if you are someone like that, it would make my day if you would come on down to the bullpen and give me a high five. I would love to high five you, maybe even pray a little prayer over you for God's work that's going on in your life. That's incredibly meaningful and uh, I'd love to be able to celebrate with you. So come and, and tell me after the service if you made that decision. Uh, if not, come on back next week. We're gonna be talking about the resurrection two weeks in a row here. You guys are getting like the double bonus. It's gonna come back next week and it's gonna be exciting. So bring your friends along and uh, we will pray and talk about the resurrection. God bless you guys. 
Hey, thanks again for engaging with us today. And it would mean so much if you would take a moment to email us at online at cccomaha.org and let us know how this impacted your life. And don't forget to go to youtube.com slash cccomaha to subscribe to our channel, like it, ring the bell, get notifications about all of the other content that we post throughout the week. God bless.